the, the first issue in our new Magnum Chronicle series. Uh, the idea for Chronicles was born out of some personal frustration in a way. Me and, and many of my colleagues at Magnum work for some of the world's top publications as photographers. In many ways, that platform to reach millions of people is a, is a tremendous privilege, but it's also very limited. A role is often illustrative or constrained by editorial sensibilities that often promote a vague sense of newsworthiness over nuance and depth, well-informed provocation, perhaps a healthy dose of confusion, unease, and contradiction. After more than a dozen years of working in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the innumerable massive and continuous ripple effects from 9-11, I've had more and more trouble seeing stories wrapped up in a neat bow. To me, it is one messy, sweeping story, spilling continuously into the next with no end in sight. Like many photographers, I've tried to turn to books to go deeper and on my own terms. But photo books have limitations as well. The market for them is small, the cost is often prohibitive, and the majority of buyers or collectors or aficionados that often are ideologically aligned with the intent of the photographer. My primary goal as a photographer has always been to communicate and I became increasingly restless with my, with my options. It seemed like the choices were either a mass audience for little authorship, or authorship for a tiny audience. Was there a space in between? Was there a way of leveraging Magnum's vast archive of the 20th and 21st centuries in the process? I was sitting in a restaurant about a mile from the Bataclan in November 2015 when the Paris attacks occurred. I ran out of the restaurant, grabbed my camera from my hotel, and threaded through the gaps in the hasty police lines to a few blocks in the Bataclan, where I made two or three frames of a covered body under a street lamp before being noticed and thrown out. Although I had been very close to a brutal terrorist attack, with all its attendant fears and sleepless nights that followed, in the aftermath, for the upteenth time, I became increasingly frustrated with the superficial ways that ISIS was being presented in the mainstream discourse. ISIS is the boogeyman of Western fears, and seemingly largely immune from thoughtful understanding and self-reflection. The news was breathless and somewhat hysterical, rarely taking into account the long arc of history that had preceded it. Thus, from these various forces, Magnum Chronicles was ultimately born. History and how we interpret it is constantly in flux, but there are moments that demand thoughtful reflection with that expectation of definitiveness. Chronicles allows us to react to critical issues with a timeliness that is difficult in a full-length book. The rise and seem and fall of the Islamic State is the most recent chapter in an era of unraveling in the Middle East. ISIS has captured the world's attention in a way that decades of colonialism, authoritarianism, and the external meddling from both regional and global powers have not. Without minimizing the impact of their crimes on millions of people, this work seeks to place ISIS in the context of the long view of history. To that end, and, and with the great help of Francesca Sears from Magnum, we settled on a structure for publication that would be made widely available for free. There's a digital version, downloadable on our website, and with the kind help of Newspaper Club, we printed 20,000 copies, which we are distributing for free in schools and cultural institutions throughout the world. Though Chronicles represents in many ways a Western-centric perception of ISIS, we hope its value transcends that narrative and have had it, had it translated into Arabic. The images from 20 photographers span the end of the French mandate in Syria to the fall of Mosul last year. Photographs at their best convey a vast range of the human experience and stand as the symbols of an era, but they are fundamentally a non-narrative medium, and we are cautious of stripping the subject matter of context. We commissioned Peter Harling, formerly of the International Crisis Group, to write a pointed essay, and together with his associate, Rosé Bertier, we crafted a timeline of the rise of jihadism that spans from the end of the Ottoman Empire to the present. That being said, I think it's best to let the contrib contributors of Chronicles speak for themselves. I'd like to read a brief ex excerpt from Peter Harling's essay. In truth, the Islamic State could never have built an Islamic State, nor could it provide sustainable forms of governance, meaningful vehicles for representation, or redemption for the many failures of the power structures it purported to replace. All told, it only adds to a long list of fiascos a calamity of its own. It has, however, controlled the narrative, making everything about the Islamic State itself. It shapes perceptions to the point of being associated with anything Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern. That is how it permeates this portfolio, though its pages contain few black flags, scenes of decapitation, and other hallmarks of the movement's brand. A mere picture of ancient Palmyra may come to evoke the Islamic State, when of course it tells another story. These noble ruins have weathered such wrath and wreckage that history may treat ISIS's passage as a blip. The Islamic State is a more amorphous and porous creature, 
a sponge that will soak up whatever comes its way. Disgruntled losers in a disastrous American attempt to engineer a new political order in post-2003 Iraq. Forsaken Syrians subjected to their regime's nightmarish collective punishment. Underdogs lacking any other form of employment. Reasonably educated Arabs or Europeans frustrated with entirely unrelated issues. And a handful of old-fashioned jihadists who have no better place to go. Most of its recruits flipped more than they took holy orders. In a treasure trove of data files tracking incoming volunteers, leaked from within the Islamic State's proto-bureaucracy, a large majority of new entrants admitted unapologetically to having virtually no religious upbringing. So much for debating the maliciousness of Islam as the obvious source of deviation. Despite its proclamations, supported by ample Western and Arab pontification on the subject, the Islamic State never was close to subverting the colonial era frontiers that structure the Arab world, a resilient legacy not so easily undone. It has been more successful in redrawing borders inside our minds. It is shifting the lines within our societies at the expense of Muslims, who unlike other minorities are expected to fully integrate to the extent of dissolving any specific identity or be ostracized as suspect. It is splitting Europeans from each other and from their natural neighborhood across the Mediterranean, reversing incomplete processes of integration. And it is displacing our moral boundaries in ways that subvert the very foundation of our culture. For fear of the Islamic State, we will tolerate any forms and levels of abuse on the part of those claiming, often preposterously, to fight it, even when their violence approaches, if not surpasses, that of the enemy. The more we let it fire up and control our imagination, the more we invite it inside us putting our agency in its service. So I'll show some pictures from this publication. You all have it in detail here, so I'll only show a selection. And I'd like to read also a few stories from, written by some of the photographers. Photography is one of these difficult mediums in that it can have such incredible power in the individual image, but how those images connect to one another often kind of a, asks more questions than it's able to answer. So as someone who writes a lot in my own process in my work, I thought it was important when we were doing this, uh, and Fran as well, to make sure that we get the photographer's voices as much as possible so that we understand kind of what became before and what came after the images, not just what's contained in it. I mean, this is the funny thing about photography, as, as many of us know, uh, is that oftentimes the most significant experiences don't necessarily make a great picture. And sometimes a great picture, you know, has, has nothing to say about it at all. So by adding words in conjunction with the photo, we have sort of a deeper level of meaning where you look at a cross, hopefully. You know. These early images are, are from Syria in the 40s, and the French Mandate and the immediate aftermath of World War II. We shaped it also so we had archival images that partly show, you know, the place and what was lost in it. And the original kind of antecedents of this modern wave of, of jihadism as we see it in the West and in 9-11 and the events that followed. And the idea was to rely on, on images with kind of great visual power, but not to repeat the kind of obvious icons that we're already familiar with. The fall of Iraq and the end of the Ba'ath Party under Paul Bremer's mandate, which kind of formed the early seeds of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and, and later the Islamic State. And then we get into the more modern archive, images from Syria, from Iraq, from Libya, from Afghanistan to some degree. ISIS and its relationship to the Western world as much as its relationship locally. And it's all intermingled in a, in a sequence based on, on kind of emotion and aesthetic more than it is by chronology.
beginning of the battle of Mosul. And towards the end of the battle of Mosul. This is a photograph taken by Magnum photographer Alessandro Sanguinetti right after the, uh, the truck attack in Nice. And it was uh, taken in the apartment building of the attacker. And she asked uh, one of the neighbors to, to write something. And the sign reads, tra translated from the French, to him, I do not judge you. However, I am not endorsing the way you treat your fellow man. Whatever were your reasons, hatred only leads to further hatred. To the others, I am with you wholeheartedly. Even if I'm not throwing rocks at anybody, I'm not a saint, but I don't want to be a part of this nonsense. And it's in kind of pictures like this and that, that kind of forms sort of the reason I wanted to do a publication like this. You know, what I've always kind of loved and admired about Magnum and the reason I wanted to be a part of it in the first place was that beyond the, the, the more traditional photojournalistic work that I myself kind of am a part of, you know, there's all these layers of subtlety and a way of looking at uh, these subjects that I, it would never even occur to me. And it's in those that vast range of sensibilities that, that collectively I think we have a lot of power. Martin Carr and on a beach vacation. This is one of the more brutal images in the book, and maybe in some ways one of the more familiar visual representations of ISIS, but we really kind of both see these images taken from a photojournalistic perspective where the narrative isn't being wholly controlled by ISIS, nor hear the, the story of what happened at that moment. So if you'll forgive me for lingering on such a brutal image, I'm going to read the story by, uh, written by Amin Osman, who's a, a Turkish photographer that joined Magnum last year. In 2011, when the civilian conflict started in Syria, I felt the war come home. It was one hour away by plane from my house in Istanbul. I was comfortable with this big tragedy happening so close to me. I was uncomfortable with this tragedy, big tragedy happening so close to me. In 2012, I crossed the Turkish-Syrian border. I found myself deep in this bloody war. Day and night operations, interrogations, torture. On August 31st, 2013, I witnessed a dark day in northern Syria. Four Shabiha members, Assad's militia, were charged as informants, murderers, thieves, and delivering ten free Syrian army soldiers to the regime. They were to be executed by the Al-Qaeda-linked uh, Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham. To this day, the people at the execution had no control over their. On this day, the people at the execution had no control over their feelings, their desires, their anger. It was impossible to stop them. I don't know how old the victim was, but he was young was forced to his knees. The rebels around him read out his crimes from a sheet of paper. They stood around him. The man on his knees on the ground, his hands tied. He seemed frozen. I felt awful. Several times I was on the verge of throwing up, but I kept it under control because as a journalist, I knew I had to document this. The crowd began cheering. Everyone was happy. I knew that if I tried to intervene, I would be taken away and that the executions would go ahead. I knew that I wouldn't be able to change what was happening and I might put myself in danger. The war in Syria has reached the point where a person can be mercilessly killed in front of hundreds of people who enjoy the spectacle. As a human being, I would never have wished to see what I saw, but as a journalist, I had a camera and a responsibility. That's why I'm making this statement, and that's why I took the photographs. And this is an unusual image, in many ways a quiet image, a way that an image that wouldn't really have a place on, on the front page of a newspaper. But in its kind of quiet qualities, it also has, I think, some layers of meaning. It's the, it's the beard clippings of, of uh, Islamic State fighters that had uh, shaved their beards as they were fleeing from Syria. And Lorenzo Maloney, an Italian uh, nominee at Magnum, who's been covering the, the Islamic State in great depth and with great kind of bravery for the last four years, had, had this to say. For almost four years, I've been following the tracks of the Islamic State, hunting for any kind of information about it. I entered their empty houses, the places they used for eating, sleeping, planning, and fighting. I've been searching for evidence, trying to understand who they really are, how they think and act in their daily life. I find myself almost empathizing with them, asking myself, what if I had been born in that country, in that situation? What would I have done? 
who would I have been? In their propaganda, they always portray themselves proudly, with long hair and long beards, fighters with no fear, the same images that most of the media have used to show their acts of terror. This simple picture reminds me of their humanity, that they are also cowards and subject to fear. The hair and beards strewn, strewn all over the floor have recently been cut by an IS fighter in an attempt to flee from the Battle of Sirte and escape as a civilian. I'll leave you with this last image taken by, by the English photographer Mark Power in a, in a refugee camp in Jordan. And it's just a simple image of, of a cheap carpet and, and the dirt floor it tries to cover up. Mark said, I no longer believe in photography's ability to change the world, but five days spent in two Syrian refugee camps in the Jordanian desert did at least change me, and for the better. Doctors, lawyers, scientists, artists, all manner of highly educated people were living together in cramped and squalid conditions. Yet spirits hadn't been dampened. To a man, woman, and child, most talked of nothing but going home. I was offered endless cups of tea and plates of simple food at every turn, and one little girl even gave me half a toy giraffe, which today sits in pride of place in my office as a constant reminder of how close we all are to the brink. Let's get back to what visual stories are all about. And so it's a question for how, as a photographer, whether you're working for that in the field, how you can provide what is not fake news, what is reality, and perhaps how, through the imagery, the visual storytelling, and particularly backstories, you know, the ones that are being blasted all over by broadcast press, and we're dealing with still photography, we're dealing with still images that make you contemplate and revisit. How can we, in that genre, be able to trigger change for the good, or at least at the very, at the very, very least, be able to open up the minds to see what the truth is? I mean, this idea of reality is everyone has their own truth, of course, as we know, and. Look, these things are always being defined, and I can speak for myself, and uh, I've become incredibly skeptical over time and increasingly confused the more experience I have. A publication like this is born out of that confusion in some ways. You know, it's also born out of a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. But if I think back to 2003 and the invasion of Iraq, I was 22 years old. I was in university. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to cover conflict. And yet I sort of abhorred all these things. And I already had some skepticism about the power structure, generally speaking. But I believe the New York Times. The New York Times convinced me that the war in Iraq was maybe not the worst idea out there. And, uh, and, and when I first started covering Iraq a few years later, you know, the Times is very much beginning not only to hedge, but to turn against that narrative, as was sort of most mainstream publications throughout the rest of the world. But when you look back at that moment in time, you wonder, you know, how so much was missed. Hindsight is twenty twenty. we all know that. But there also seemed to be a kind of willful ignorance. And I began to question, frankly, the whole power structure that dominates, uh, essentially, the, the publications I work for and the publications we hold dear. So I think this, to answer, that's a roundabout way of saying the first starting point for me has been one of profound skepticism all around profound skepticism of my conclusions, always challenging them, skepticism of the inst of politicians, skepticism of the institutions I, I work within, and trying to try and find as many diverse and knowledgeable voices as possible to always kind of challenge whatever beliefs I think I may hold. And then through that, slowly, I began to begin to maybe arrive at certain conclusions, which are then again fairly rapidly upended. But that's not actually troubling for me. In fact, in many ways, it's kind of liberating and empowering. Know. And, and as I say, and that's where a publication like this is born from, which is meant to kind of not be the definitive narrative of this, because what is truth, but to be an uh, alternative view to uh, a narrative we think we know, and the one that's in many ways kind of uh, uh, foisted upon us because many publications kind of, you know, parrot each other, you know, in trying to explain situations, you know. Journalists can be uh, far less free-thinking than they believe themselves to be. I'm probably going to get flayed alive for saying these things in this room, but anyhow. What can you do? <laughs>
Hello, my name is uh, Callum Payton. I'm a uh, journalist for Newsweek. Um, one of the things that we haven't touched on as much, although we certainly have, is the um, the way that you described Islamic State as uh, being a boogeyman that the West uh, had partly created, and I believe that's true, but an Islamic State more than perhaps Al-Qaeda before it was also able to manipulate propaganda and social media in a way seen before. Um, <clears throat> I always thought when I was in Libya or in Iraq that these groups were very uh, heterogeneous, um, but as soon as they pledged allegiance, they were able to become homogenous, kind of wave the black flag. <clears throat> um, I'm wondering if you think another group will emerge, or whether ISIS will emerge again, and whether they will still have that same whether they will be able to use the social media to, in the same way. Why don't you gentlemen take this one? Um, you're my guest. <laughs> um, yeah, I think every, I mean, every organization, you know, from the local golf club upwards, you can use the social media uh, in future, and certainly it will be used. Um, again, there was sort of, uh, when Daesh started using it in sort of 2013-14. They clearly thought about it very carefully. Uh, the sort of films that were designed to terrify, particularly the Iraqi army, of, you know, you'd see films of a sniper, a guy with a sniper with the point of light going off somebody's chest and then bang, they'd be shot. Uh, or people be executed beside the road. These had a, a massive influence. Um, and uh, probably that sort of thing will, will go on. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're not the first group to use terror, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, when the Mongols invaded Iran, they, you know, in the 13th century, they chopped off everybody's head and put them up in piles, you know, that, that spreading terror is a military tactic. I think terror was more sort of integrated into Daesh as a sort of strategy, the mass use of suicide bombers, for instance, than any previous uh, organization. Um, so, yeah, I think of the social media, everything else will be uh, used by organizations in future. It's easier to use. Um, it poses great challenges for traditional media. In some ways this is good, because as Peter was saying, a lot of the traditional media is sort of representative of the powers that be. It has a very strong herd instinct, all saying the same thing at the same time. Uh, it's often uh, a critical. Um, so there's a strong uh, democratic element uh, there. But it also is uh, easy to manipulate. It's very easy to put out propaganda. Uh, you know, people talk about fake news as if this was something invented three years ago. People have always been putting out fake news. Uh, it's just easier to do now. And I think that the sort of uh, existing media has never really sort of thought through perhaps sufficiently how you should cope with this. You know, if you have pictures coming out of, uh, let's say, Duma, Eastern Ghouta, uh, you know, the BBC made tremendous efforts to authenticate these, whether these were true or not. But actually, that's not quite enough, because, you know, a good propagandist always tells the truth, but you always tell the truth that's in your interests. You just show the crimes of the other side, and the good deeds of your own. Um, so television, I think, during the last few years, and newspaper coverage, a lot of it's particularly pictures, videos, uh, the partiality of the source was generally not something that television dwelt on when they were dealing, uh, dealing with this. Uh, frankly, you know, if you, if you just produce stuff about the crimes of 
one side and all the sides in Syria do not commit crimes, then you're basically producing uh, propaganda. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm here, because organizations like Magnum have a, the picture has a credibility. Uh, because you know where it comes from. In a way, the pictures that appear on the social media that are taken by local people must have a lower degree of credibility. Because we don't know what the, uh, the motives or the partisanship of the people who took them. So, yeah, but I think that this is going to be the picture of the world in the future. It's all going through social media. But the partiality of the source extends also to to us, in a, in a sense. I mean, we're here talking about the Islamic State, for example. I just edited a whole publication about the Islamic State. If there were, I don't know if there are any Syrians or Iraqis in the crowd right now, but they would probably ask, as they've asked rightly so, as my partner is Syrian, uh, what's with the obsession about the Islamic State when the greatest crimes, the most meaningful crimes, the greatest brutality has been caused by the Assad regime, who, you know, uh, has plenty of bedfellows at this point. I mean, in terms of reconstructing Syria, too, I mean, that regime is going to get loans, and uh, the Russian and Iranian construction companies are going to get the contracts, and there's going to be plenty of money made all around, and the scars will be papered over, and that's, and that's, well, that won't be that, but, but, but in the end, you know, the greatest criminal is the one that's, that's, that's still in power. And ISIS, in some ways, is a sideshow. And this is something that I feel deeply troubled by, which is that I, that in the end, within the West, we control so much of this narrative. But I often wonder if we're focusing a little bit on the wrong things. I, I look at myself uh, very much in that regard. People find that this is, you know, somewhat maybe a, a criticism of the way that they're telling this, these similar stories. I just wondered what what the response has been like. Uh, positive so far. I, well, if anyone has any point of criticisms, I'd love to hear them, actually. I mean, we've, we've tried to take in as many parameters as possible into account, but this is anything but an objective publication. It doesn't claim to be. It has a defined point of view. The essay is, you know, a time, the timeline of events is based on a narrative of the rise of jihadism that I think is well sourced in history but is also subjective. The essay is very subjective. The edit of the selection of pictures, I mean it's 50 pictures over 70 years. One could never call 50 pictures over 70 years a potentially objective or even hinting at objectivity is, is a structure. So. So it's, it's, it's unabashedly an interpretation, but I think one hopefully born from, you know, a lot of thinking and, and, and a lot of kind of critical self-analysis and, and, and a lot of thought, both from my experience and those of kind of, you know, colleagues and friends who are of these places and, or have worked in these places for many years, and it sort of became a, a, a brain trust in a way of, of, of thinking in different forms. But... Like anything else, it's not it's not perfect, and I'm sure it has its holes. And if there are those in the audience who have time to spend some time with it and 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 find things they really take strong exception to and want to articulate that kind of carefully, I'd be very curious to, to hear them. Certainly, and we want to keep doing this sort of publication and 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 you know improve as we go along. I'd be especially interested to hear your thoughts actually when you go through it. You know. Yeah, I, I told you I, I like it. You know, I like it very much because it's let's say it's putting everything in a completely different context. You know, which is not acceptable of anywhere in the world. You know, especially in the Western establishments, you know, they don't accept this narrative when it comes to explaining jihadism. That's why it's a big challenge. I like it. I'm, I'm still doing a lot of research, by the way. You know, about it. it's uh, it's it's a very long one. We start from the Ottoman Empire, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. We're collecting a lot of documents about it. How because there's a lot of things happening there, you know. It starts from there, which is the era of modern jihad. Everybody understanding Islam and knows what's the meaning of like the legislation of using violence in the name of Islam religiously, using Quran, quoting the Prophet. Uh, a lot of people they lack this understanding, by the way. 
but during that period, let's say like 1908, 1922, okay? Because the Ottoman Empire fought in a lot of countries in that period, and if you see at the time a lot of fatwas being issued, okay, which is completely different from the old fatwas, I don't understand the like, Gobjahar. How people, they, you know, when the, like, if you, for instance, the Italian decision in 1920 to colonize Libya. Everybody studied from an international relations point of view only or for colonialism, but if you go through the period that I told you about it, and what was the religious interpretation of that, then you will understand what I'm trying to say. Yes. Especially, yeah, yeah, if you understand Mr. Baruni and, like, uh, uh, Ahmed Sharif, you know, how they decide, you know, just even to the extent to sacrifice a Libyan interest, you know, just to serve the Ottoman Empire, you know, like the attack against the British troops in Egypt by Mr. Baruni, which is a Libyan from the, the, the uh, Berber ethnic, you know, but just to serve the Ottoman Empire orders, you know, he, uh, he launched war in Egypt against the, the, the British troops there when it has nothing to do with the Libyan conflict. You understand? A lot of things, I don't know about, just we, we are studying, you know, this period. Very well. I think what is here, it's a big challenge, and I'm 100% for it, you know? Yeah. Uh, good luck, you know, thank you very much. I like it, yeah. It's exceptionally yeah. important. Honestly, yeah. I, I was, I, I've been taken by surprise, by the way. You know, what is it? Wow. <laughs> no, honestly, this is a really new understanding or a challenge of addressing the issue, uh, you know, from the source. Because every time, where I go on, when I start about like de-radicalization, okay, what's the source of extremism, whatever? Everybody starts to talk about the economy, numbers, GBD, Gagala, <laughs> poor people. It's not. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, Saudis, they are not poor people. Most of them middle class and upper middle class. I've seen thousands and thousands for the last 35 years of Saudis. Most of them, there's no way under any, like, you know, you classify them as the poor people. Why they are the most nation contributing to terrorism and what's called jihad. Okay, it's a big defeat for the socio-economic circumstances as a root cause of extremism. If you see all the leaders, you know, the founders of the jihad, the leaders, people that are very intellectual, coming from like a very strong understanding of jihad, most of them upper middle class. Starts from Biladin, so all the leaders I've seen, I, I know all them personally, you know, Bilal used to be my friend. I had a lot of debates against him, you know, especially when he launched a crazy war against the U.S., whatever. I, I doubted him, you know, but it's, most of the people, they said I lied. I told him, you are just a nuts, a crazy person that you're going to, yeah, no, because he reached the point when he starts to think he's the chosen one, believe it or not. Yeah, there's a time when you go like this. Yeah, there's no answer, because he believes God will help him, I'm telling you this. I spent one week with him in his house, one week, every day, debating him about his stupid idea. But he believed, that's it, he must go on his path, it's being chosen for him, there is no exceptionalization. Just you need to do it, and that's it. Okay? So, all of these people, they are, they are you know, like, they know, they feel what I think. Zawahri, uh, the leaders of the Egyptian Jama'at Islamiyah, Dr. Omar Abdurrahman, you know, the guy who died, in, or still suffering, in, oh, died, 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 in the US. All of them, lawyers. Engineers, you know, yeah. I've never seen anyone reach the level of leadership of any group, like even in Afghanistan, by the way, the leaders of the Afghan jihad, you know, the top, all of them, they're well educated, they're rich people, they're coming from well known families, all of them. So you need to understand this as well. That's why I like it. There's an issue here. If you talk about the root cause of extremism, that's why it's there. And I like David Cameron's speech, you know, like maybe two years ago when he said, This is a war of generations. I completely agree with him. But how to fight it? That's the challenge. So, there's a question. There's a question. It's okay. Sure, let's have a question. Go ahead. No, we need the question. Yeah. From that region, and how you interpret this ideology within the post colonial reaction? Like, do you remember when ISIS crossed from Syria to Muslim, they put the say in the end of the Sykes Pickle? Yeah. I agree with you. But I don't think it was generally propaganda, the actual, yeah, uh, yeah. the administrative boundaries that are they, they had pictures of themselves kicking over boundary fences, but actually the administrative boundaries they used, except, you know, divided Iraq from Syria, and, you know, because these have been states for a long time, you know, you know, people in Syria say Mosul should have been part of Syria, and 
Deir Azul, which is eastern uh, Syria, I shouldn't be part of Iraq, as the tribes there speak, with Iraqi accents and so forth. Um, but that wasn't their sort of main motive. They had a big sort of strategic advantage in that they were strong in Mosul, they were getting stronger there, and when uh, the Syrian uprising started, they could sort of, they were the guys with military experience, with sort of military personnel who could move into Syria and very rapidly expand into a sort of powerful army. No, uh, uh, sorry, but you want to ask a different question? Yeah, sorry, the, talking about the motivation of individuals, not the whole strategy of the mastermind of mm -hmm. uh, like, I have interviewed some uh, foreign fighters in Syria. They were recently like captured, like Beatles and other guys. And many of them, they were like born here, but they had this anger that colonialism, what had done in the Middle East and Africa, was sort of reaction for them in individual level, not into like what strategy of ISIS being used by the power of Turkey, by Saudi, by everybody, mm -hmm. by Iran, even by Russia, by everybody. But I'm thinking about, I'm talking about the individual motivation of a young yes. person in I agree with it's, it's, it's the ideology. It's, it's the ideology, you know. First of all, just you need to explain things here, you know. Most of them, not all of them, even the non-violent political Islam, all of them, without no exceptions, they believe in the nation. This is a very strong ideological force, nation of Islam. Nation of Islam doesn't accept this world, okay? But everybody has his own way how to do it. If you see, I'll give you now the most acceptable political nonviolent group worldwide, even in the West, is the Muslim Brotherhood, okay? Because they participate in elections, whatever. Okay, just imagine when their ex-leader, Mr. Akov, he passed away now, okay? He says, in Egypt, like, to hell with Egypt when it comes to Islam. In public, it was, you know, like, just forced or, you know, it was out of context that they spent two years just to explain that. So he said, I wouldn't mind if a Malaysian Muslim, you know, good guy ruled Egypt than like a Egyptian. This is the leader of the most <coughs> well-accepted, moderate political Islam. You need to understand this, it's, it's the nation. That's why every time when you go to a hot zone, you will see people coming from all over the world. For me, if you ask me in Afghanistan, that was the first time in my life when I seen someone coming from Jerusalem Kamar, it's called the Commodores, you know? There was a Muslim fighting there, like 35 years ago. I saw him in Afghanistan. And he gave me his handgun as a gift. Yeah, I can remember that now, you know? And he was happy himself to be with the Ummah. Everybody talking about the nation. It's very powerful. Okay, now, the nation, how you organize it? Again, comes the other issue. If you Trust me on this, I don't believe anyone. If you go through an interview or even if you are a security servant interrogating someone, you need to be aware of this, you know. When you believe in the nation, you need to understand how you're going to organize the nation. Nation state doesn't exist in the Islamic religion at all. No way, I'm not going to accept that, you know. Anyone who is an Islamist saying that to me, I'm going to say in his face, you are a liar. Because if you believe the nation, Nation state that has no place in the Islamic theology. Okay? Like you like it. That's exactly when I said Daesh lost the battlefield, but they won the ideological war. If you see all the people here in UK, thousands and thousands of radical people, I'll tell you something, you know, just recently I was working with foreign fighters, okay? Europeans. Uh, I managed to de radicalize them. I brought them from the war zone there. One of them, he told me, oh my God, said, if you came to me like two years ago, I was willing to take my okay, British passport and just to throw it away because I don't believe I'm a British. That's what he said to me. And I said, why? He said, because I'm Muslim. Because it has no place in my life. This guy never ever been anywhere. This is his country. Okay, yeah, he's originally whatever, whatever but he, he, he educated here, you know, see, all his people, all his life, his culture is here, he's thinking like French, he's dreaming in English. But two years ago, he was like ready and he wasn't serious about it. But I'm gonna throw my passport, I don't believe in that. But he said, now, talking to you now, thank God I can do it. 
You understand? All of them. I've seen a lot of people, even people they've been deprived of their citizenship. Now they're stuck in the Kurdish area in Syria. Ladies, their families, they contact me, they said they're stuck there because they have no their original country, the European one, revoked their citizenship. They're stuck there. They are crying and they need a solution. All the when you ask them, all of them, they bring the issue of the nation. I went there because I'm sick and tired of the European societies. They corrupt our Islam. We are Muslims. The same thing. And that we need this is political entity, is like that. And now when it's collapsed, oh my God, we are facing the reality. So, getting towards the end. Other questions? This, this one here. Hi. He's been waiting. Hi. So, where Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Alex Moen, 19 year old student from the States here studying international journalism. I had a question. It's pretty clear to me that I need to learn more about history, but um, just a question for Peter. How did you get started in conflict photography uh, early on when you were in college, and how has Magnum played into your uh, growth as a storyteller, helping you understand different perspectives, giving you the opportunities um, to document what? Interested in. Um, well, the first part of the question, the, the, the conflict question, you know, I suppose, you know, I, I'm one of those folks sort of unlucky enough on some level to have uh, known from a very early age that, that somehow war was going to be a part of my identity. I suppose at first maybe it, I thought it might be as, as part of the military, um, but thanks in many ways to the power of photography, or at least that's how what I ascribe to shifting my thinking away from wanting to kind of be involved in war as a soldier to kind of wanting to document its evils, regardless of the motivation, you know, it's always sort of been in my my blood, so I always knew I'd be there one way or another, and it, and it just so happened also that kind of the history of, you know, my country and generation intersected very much with, with conflict, and, uh, and, and so by the time I graduated from university, you know, the war in Iraq was only months old, and, and I had, uh, you know, I had an excuse in many ways. To, to fulfill kind of what I always knew I would do. So, and I would say, if you don't, don't do it because of ambition or because of career reasons or whatever, you know, I would only go down that road if you have no choice. Like, I couldn't deny it even if I wanted to. So that's a strange little, you know, that's always, that's the dark heart of these things. The, the second part um, about Magnum in terms of storytelling. I mean, I think what Magnum contributes the most is really just a diverse group of, of photographers. I mean, diverse in terms of aesthetic more than anything else. Um, uh, those of you who know Magnum. Uh, and, 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 you know, in a place where a lot of people have a lot of accomplishments that are, and, are, and, and really challenge you to kind of better yourself at all times. But I'd say I've learned just as much about being a photographer and being a storyteller outside of the world of Magnum as within Magnum, because because of those reasons, Magnum has, you know, it's it's some of the best photographers in the world, photographers I admire tremendously. But but you know, the limitations of perspective there, because we are not a particularly diverse agency, and so to really kind of see the world with more kind of depth and nuance, you know, I've I've sought those sort of voices elsewhere, you know, and that's really enhanced my work, I think. That's cool. Very rapidly, see. Other questions? Yeah, for sure. I don't want to say, I don't want really, to say, I think that maybe uh, Gaddafi should have be been left where he was. Do you think the system of both um, Libya and Iraq, in a better place now, is still has strong dictatorships? I talk about other citizens and countries. Is that addressed to me? Or? Yes, it's addressed to you, sorry. Um, Libya seems to me very obviously worse off in almost every way when I mean, the country is broken up into. Uh, warring militias. Uh, Iraq, you know, if you asked Iraqis, do the Kurds feel better off? Well, yeah, they do, you know, because they were massacred by Saddam. Do the Shia feel better off? Yeah. Do the Sunni? No. You know, it depends who you are. Um, the, um, so, I think that there's a difference between, between the two. Um, 
They, uh, you see, I think one thing that people get a bit wrong about 2003, the invasion, actually I think the US and the others could have got away with an invasion and overthrew Saddam, they'd immediately got out of the country. But they didn't just invade, they occupied it, and took over everything. I was there, it was very like a colonial occupation. And a lot of that trouble stemmed from that, from the takeover of Iraq. Not just from getting rid of the Saddam. They did have a plan, it just happened to be a very bad plan. <laughs> they, they, they thought that all the, you know, that, and they'd been told by lots of Iraqis. Um, um, but, I mean, Iraqis who wanted to get rid of Saddam, of course they told the Americans, you know, you'll be greeted with sweets and flowers and so forth, you know. I don't think they expect the Americans to be that gullible, you know, or anything else. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also true, it was arrogance, you know. I remember before the war, you know, saying, I was in Washington, as a brief at a big tank, and um, one American journalist, a uh, friend of mine, a bright guy, uh, said to me, uh, was saying, you know, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing when we get to take over Iraq. And I said, well, I don't think Iraqi people will be very keen on that. He said, well, who cares what they think, you know? So there was a sense that they just couldn't give a damn what the Iraqis thought. Uh, and they very rapidly learned it did matter. So, um, you know, your question, uh, um, you know, most Iraqis pretty pleased that Saddam has gone. You know, there was, um, after all, it was Saddam who ruined the country um, from 1980, not just from, you know, from the moment he invaded Iran. You know, Iraq has had 40 years of emergency and war, which now, at the moment, seems to be coming to an end. Libya? Libya? Well, you know, it goes on and on. It's no, I can't see a particular reason why it should end, you know, particularly when you... Well, as wars go on, you, you, have, you know, we talk about all the suffering, but various people have a, an interest in the war going on, you know. Yeah. You can plug into oil, you know, you control checkpoints, you know. It used to be before 2014, you know, you wanted to be a colonel in the Iraqi army, it cost you $200,000, you bought the job. Because you could make a lot of money out of it. You do it ghost battalions, checkpoints, act like customs barriers, you know. You know, why is everything three times more expensive in Baghdad than it is in Turkey? Because they have to go through all these checkpoints, and that's pay for. So, you know, that's one of the problems about war. Same in Syria, you know, every checkpoint is, uh, is a, a way somebody is making money. Uh, rebel. Of Syrian army and the others, and that's it. So you have lots of interests that begin to be perfectly happy with the way things are going on. So are there any more questions? But then we should end. Is there somebody? Just one more yeah, no more to say. Well, uh, I'm actually a doctor still in London, and uh, some of my classmates they did something similar to this, like take a look at it and make some project. And my question is like, when we can bike to uh, publish our or some of our audience may believe that we are actually consuming them, which make us like we are actually consuming them. It's like making, make, using their pictures for our own interest, and uh, basically they may be morally being judged by the others, and they cause some against issues for them. So I would like to know how a photographer from London to deal with similar questions like that. You mean you're like people that you photograph? Yeah. That feel. That wonder why you're photographing them and to what end? Some of our, I mean, audience or you, you are of the photo may believe that we are actually doing something like that to um, using our photos to make our own interest instead of actually telling a really important story. Well, sometimes that's true though too. I mean, photographs aren't just one thing. Photographs don't just tell a, a story of truth and purity. Photographs are very capable of exploiting. Um, I mean, there's just, there's, there's a lot been written about ethics and photojournalism. Um, just, just, just start with Googling it and you'll get pretty far. Susan Sontag is the classic kind of thinker about using images of people and suffering and what it means to make those choices and how you think about the way you use those pictures in a context of the mass media. If, you, if those are questions of yours, things you're thinking about, and if you're studying photojournalism, you should always be thinking about them every day of your whole career, uh, then the best place to start, I would say, is read Susan Sontag's book regarding the pain of others. 
that, I mean, that's that's the short answer, and that, that, that book will tell you a lot of what you need to know. You might not agree with every word of it, but like, you know, it's a, it, it's a complicated question with a lot of layers, but, but um, you know, it's, it's something worth, very much worth thinking about. You know, don't, 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 if you're a journalist, you can't create any pop propaganda in your own mind about what the meaning of photography is, or think about it, of it as just one thing. It's many things, and capable of many things. We see that with ISIS. They're using photography too, you know, to their own ends.